Hey, everybody. Thanks for joining, everyone. Um, my name is uh, John Champo, and um, I'm here to discuss um, my homebrew retrospective, which is uh, about 40 years worth of uh, developing classic video games for various systems, um, starting with the uh, Atari 800, going through uh, the DOS um, computers uh, back in the 90s, and then eventually settling back to the, uh, the 2600 that I designed games for back when I was like 14. So, um, so getting back to that was kind of like a uh, way for me to get to um, what I wanted to do since I was a kid. So even though it's just a hobby, it's still a good way to uh, you know, do the things that you want to do as a kid and you have the m money and time to actually spend on it um, when you get older. So um, Dave, I was asked by David to come and speak here. And uh, I have a booth set up up there with a bunch of the games I've developed with 2600, if you're interested after the show, to come take a look and see what kind of stuff uh, I've been working on. So anyway, so all um, right, the first one. Okay, so we're gonna go way back here. We're gonna go all the way to uh, um, 1978. I'm born in 68, so that puts me 10 years old at that point. That's so when I first played the Atari. It was at a department store called Markers in uh, Dayville, Connecticut. Um, I have three brothers who are all about the same age. Um, they could never tell us apart either, so I was the cute one. Um, but <laughs> um, anyway, we went to Barker's and I played combat for the first time with my brother and uh, fell in love with it. Um, my mother at the time, um, she was single and um, single mom raising us four. And, uh, as we were playing, she could tell how much we liked it. Um, and unbeknownst to us, while we were playing it, it was probably October of 78, she had snuck in the back and purchased it from the, uh, from the uh, salesperson and put it in the, uh, in the car. Um, and it showed up on Christmas morning. So it was quite, quite a thrill. That was uh, my introduction to uh, video games. And uh, um, she bought a bunch of cartridges for us as well. Um, played like Home Run. Basketball, air sea battle, combat, all the classics. So um, <clears throat> that's where my love of video games had started. Um, so then um, we fast forward to 1982. So you can imagine by then we've had um, numerous other releases for the Atari. Um, Space Invaders being a big one of the Activision games, certainly loved as well. My friend Dennis and I actually designed um, a game called Mountain Raider. Um, that was our big. Um, I was 14 in time, so my dream was I'm gonna design video games. I'm gonna um, send these off to Atari, and they're gonna send me a lot of money, and I'm not gonna have to get a real job. <laughs> but they did actually respond to me, and I actually have a, a copy of the letter here. Um, and unfortunately, they said the game was too complicated, um, which would also inspire me um, in my, uh, my later days. If I look at the games I have made um, since then, they are all fairly complicated, but um, always pushing the Atari to its limits. Um, but anyway, so they sent us a rejection letter, and but they also sent us this real cool poster of Atari stars, you know, a centipede. And I don't know whatever happened to the, uh, the poster. I think Dennis ended up with it. But anyway, so I was not uh, thwarted by that because after that, we ended up buying the... Um, my mom saw that I was more interested in making games than playing them, even though I love playing them. Um, so um, in my... Uh, when I was in high school, she bought me an Atari 800. And that's where I started developing. Um, I didn't know much about development um, back then. And uh, certainly the resources weren't available, like on the internet to teach yourself stuff. So I bought a few books, um, bought um, um, Compute Magazine. I don't know if anyone remembers that from the, the old days where they'd, uh, I don't know how much fun this sounds like, they would send you the, <laughs> um, send you the magazine and be like 600 pages of a program you'd have to type in exactly verbatim in the same in assembly. You just messed up one thing, the thing didn't work. Um, and then you'd save it to a tape drive. Um, there's a quick side story. Um, I'd gotten this game, um, it was called Logger. It was like a fraud or clone. And I typed the whole thing in and I had a bad habit of not saving to the um, tape drive. This is before disk drives. I don't know if anyone remembers the tape drives, but when you would say to the tape drive, it would take like 15, 20 minutes. And I was too impatient because that whole time you're saving, you can't be programming. It'd be like two or three more in the morning. So 
we lived in this old Victorian, very, very shoddy power supply. It was like one 15, um, 15 amp fuse bullet kind of thing. So if you had like, you know, two light switches on and the TV and someone turned on the toaster to pull the fuse, you can see where this is going, right? So <laughs> I'd spent like nine hours typing this thing and hadn't saved it. And of course someone had to have an English muffin at the same time my mom was making coffee. <laughs> <laughs> the whole thing goes down. I was like so upset. But anyway, um, I persevered. I, st I actually st took a deep breath. Actually, I think I hit the table. And then I stopped and I typed in the whole thing again, nonstop, except every hour I would save. So I did not lesson learned. So. But anyway, so that's where I really cut my teeth on learning how to program is uh, through those programs. But since I wasn't smart enough or old enough to learn assembly, um, I focused mostly on doing the basic games. Those basic games were, um, I did like a karate type game. Um, and basically what it was is you would alter the ASCII character set. Um, and then you're basically just drawing these ASCII characters on the screen at the same time to simulate like a, um, video games and stuff like that. So, so I did like a, a karate game. I did like a Wizard of War type game. And, uh, some other games, so that kind of got me through high school and uh, took my first computer course and, uh, and went to uh, the University of Connecticut in, in stores um, where I studied uh, um, software engineering. Um, and that's where I learned things like C and assembly and things that I would use later on for, which we'll get to. I know we're on slide one here, but um, just kind of giving an um, overview of where my love for development came from and uh, kind of the early parts of uh, or influences that, that got me to that, mostly my mom and, uh, you know, her investment in what she saw in what something I was actually had some potential in. It really was the only thing I was good at. I was, you know, I was terrible with a hammer and couldn't really uh, do anything else. So she said, well, let's just make sure this kid at least uh, doesn't have to do anything you know, any physical labor and all we will do fine. So, um, anyway, so let's get to, uh, I also did a really, really cool piano simulator. I know, I'm sure we all like 80s music, Asia, Journey, stuff like that. So I, I do play the piano self-taught. Actually, my mother was self-taught as well. So I did develop a, uh, so it was like a MIDI type program for the Atari where uh, you could put in the notes with a joystick and have the staff or anything like that, save it to the, uh, what we now had was a disk drive and um, and play songs, stuff like that, like all four voices. So it was kind of cool. So, so again, it was another way to uh, um, take something I love like development and music, put together, and I was going to make the great, you know, the next great uh, music sing, um, sequencer. Um, also, I put together a, uh, I don't know how boring this sounds, but I wrote a, um, a word processor called Right Away, R I T. <laughs> <laughs> my uh, my computer science teacher in uh, high school was very impressed by him, so and I did get an A. So, um, but anyway, so enough about that. Um, I did allude to Mountain Raider. Mountain Raider was the one game design I designed in '82 when we sent it off to Atari. Uh, I know you can't really see the letter, but um, if you guys want to read it later, it's basically from Cassie something or other saying, "Great job. We don't have uh, you know can't really use your design now, but enjoy this poster." There's a quick snapshot of one of the uh, um, design. It was a very professional design written up on my uh, uh, Smith Corona typewriter. With the uh, it was an advanced one with the built-in, um, you know, the eraser. You guys, anyone here ever used a typewriter? Yeah. Or you had to like shift and it had like the white band. And yeah. You oh, retype yeah. the same yeah. thing. You use those in high school. Yeah, exactly. So, so it was great. So, um, so we typed up this whole thing. Basically, it was uh, inspired by all of our favorite games at the time. Um, Scramble being one of them, which never came out in the Atari at the time, but we do have good news about that coming up. Um, and Berserk and, uh, and a few other games um, that it was, uh, it, was, it was based on. So um, anyway, so I still have the design of that. And uh, since that was 82, next year is 2022. I am planning on finally actually making this game because I'm, I'm sick of porting old games. So but anyway, so... That was basically phase one. Um, late 80s, after I'd uh, gone to college and learned um, C and assembly, and that's when I decided to, hey, you know, I'm into PC gaming now, um, DOS specifically. 
So let's uh, let's take what I know and see if I can uh, make some some cool video games. So um, at a Tandy 1000 EX old Radio Shack, people know what Radio Shack is, I hope. And I made a Missile Command clone called Last Defense. That's such cool names. Um, then Last Defense too, but none of them came out. It was kind of cool. It was like Missile Command, but also had like uh, extra weapons and stuff like that. So instead of just firing, um, you know, a missile, it would be like a concussion bomb and all these other things flying around. So it was kind of fun. It was an EGA graphics. It was kind of slow. It didn't really work out this well. This was before VGA in the 256 color, 320 by 200 mode, which is really what spurned on um, the DOS gaming um, revolution with things like Doom and stuff like that. You know, everything before that was kind of uh, um, not as much. So anyway, so now to be fast forward to 93, I finally graduated after seven years. Thank you. Um, <laughs> um, and uh, I want to play Pac-Man on my, uh, um, on my uh, I don't think it was a tanning by then. I must have gotten something a little bit cooler. Um, and um, I went to AOL and they had all these downloads you could do. And the uh, Pac-Man clones weren't that good. And of course, I'm you know, confident in myself. So I'll just write my own. So, so I did. And it was called Pac-Maniac. Um, and at that time, didn't really have access. The arcades were going away. So you didn't have access to Pac-Man. Uh, MAME hadn't been introduced yet. Um, there were no things, nothing like uh, Microsoft Arcade. So um, you didn't really have a, um, anything to base it on. I did have an Atari 800 with their um, um, version of Atari that I used kind of as a basis. That's why the ghosts look kind of weird and the maze was a little strange, but um, I always thought the version was pretty good. So I used that as my, uh, my basis. Um, I uploaded it and people were pretty impressed. So I got some good feedback. Got my first check for $10. And I'm sending it now. Um, um, but anyway, um, so that felt pretty good. And that um, wasn't really my, this is, wasn't really why I did it to start making money, but um, I saw that's what other people were doing. Uh, I had released a show where I saw. After doing that, I decided, well, um, I started getting some messages saying, hey, why don't you make asteroids and um, galaxy and centipede and stuff like that. So I did. So I just threw those together over the course of the next three years, and they all were pretty pretty well received. Um, and that's when, you know, mine starts going on 19, whatever, it was like 20 something years old at the time. I think it was 25, well. Um, but at that point, it's thinking, hey, that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna, I may make, make video games, right? Um, but I had a real job too, so, and so but it was, it was a good, good start. Um, so then um, I ended up, uh, getting some people to help out with me, uh, especially things like graphics and sound, a professional sound guy doing some sound effects for me, a graphics guy that um, was putting together some graphics and we came out with uh, another bunch of games in uh, 80, 96, 98 through 98. Um, the biggest one being Champ Kong. At this point, I decided that, you know, I should probably at least start changing the names a little because, you know, it was, I know all the news games, obviously. It was just more of a, something I fell into is like, everyone's making Pac-Man clones, so I make one, but mine's too good. So it's like, uh, you gotta start changing names and stuff like that. So, um, so that led to uh, um, making some re remakes of these games, um, Pac-Man and Miss Pac-Man with uh, better graphics and sounds. And then uh, I did some other uh, additional games as well. So, so that's kind of an overview of the, uh, what happened in the DOS days. So we'll just quickly go through uh, so you can actually see some of the screenshots and things like that. So this was the original uh, logo I had for the game starting up in uh, the uh, early 90s um, with um, Galaxy and uh, Pac-Mania and stuff like that. So started in 93, um, made the games for DOS. It was uploaded um, to AOL as shareware. Uh, the games themselves were written in C and all the graphics routines were written in assembly. It's kind of what gave me the advantage over these other, and a lot of the other games were decent, but they were very choppy. The graphics weren't that good and stuff like that. I think a lot of it had to do with that they were using like the C routine to do their graphics. Um, but I had taken an operating system class at UConn and basically had to write the Windows 3.1 kernel in assembly for my Steam project. So back in 88, so I was really, you know, assembly was something I was passionate about. 
So being able to write all the graphics routines and that, that really uh, gave me a leg up against the competition. Um, I use the term loosely because obviously it was just a bunch of guys just making clones for the, uh, the PC. Um, and again, again, like I said, I had my Atari 800 um, set up to uh, kind of inspire me on uh, how to uh, um, mimic the gameplay and stuff like that. I, didn't, I don't dis disassemble code. I don't, uh, you know, even though I'm taking the ideas, I don't take the code and I don't take the sound or anything like that. I was just uh, basically play the game and then try to interpret the best I can using, you know, whatever skill I had. So, um, so here's some screenshots. I just threw a bunch of these together and kind of overlapped through five, so I didn't know a good way to lay out. But you see pac hack in the corner there. Um, kind of has that Atari 800 vibe. Same thing for uh, Galaxian. Looks like the 5200 um, version. Asteroids. Um, I actually developed a, um, a um, tool called Motion Pictures. Kind of like Mount um, right, right Away, another cool name, Motion Pictures. Um, it was a sprite editor where you could animate stuff. Um, so I'd use that. I'd put like dithering effects that I'd learned in my um, um, graphics class in, uh, at UConn. And that's why the, uh, um, the uh, asteroids look kind of 3D because it was something I thought looked cool at the time. Um, and there's Centipede as well. So those are the first five games I put together and uploaded to AOL. Um, as we moved on to 96, 98, that was the second phase of championing the champ programming. Champ programming was kind of like the uh, the parent company, Champ Games was, because I did actually do uh, consulting work that had nothing to do with games. So that was why it was called Champ Programming. Um, but Champ Games was, was supposed to be the division that did all the video games. So um, anyway, so, um, we launched a website, you can see it there. Actually, if you go to the Wayback Machine, you can still see it, it's kind of cool. That's where I got the screenshot, because I don't, I don't have the website anymore, obviously. But, um, and that's where our Ch Champ Kong for Donkey Kong was released. That was very, very popular. People love that one. That, again, was based on the 800 version. Um, but with these new, um, this, this new phase of uh, Champ, Champ Games, um, we started doing different things where we weren't just cloning the old games, we were also developing what was called the champ mode. Um, champ mode was basically same type of gameplay, but with all different levels and power-ups and things like that. So it felt like you were getting something more than, because at this point, um, emulators were becoming somewhat popular. Microsoft Arcade was being released. Um, you know, MAME, there's some Retrocade, some other old, um, I don't know if all you guys are probably into emulation at some point um, back in the 90s. So. This is like cutting edge stuff where like they had to, like just the Pac-Man emulator and then they started adding like Ladybug and then um, and then MAME came out and kind of blew everyone's doors away, right? So but <clears throat> so we felt like there was competition there. Um, and that competition for us was answered by doing things like champ mode where so champ Kong, for example, you can play the arcade levels, so you have four completely brand new levels with elevators and different types of things and uh, bonus levels. Um, things like, uh, you know, Pac-Man had like speed patches and Galaxian had power-ups and things like that. So it was, uh, it, was a it was a cool way to uh, give something else for the people that um, were looking for something more than what MAME would, would give you, right? Because obviously if you wanted to play exactly what the arcade offered, then you would just play MAME. That's what I would do. So but anyway, so that was it. So we also developed a uh, piece of hardware called the Champ Cable. Uh, this actually got from uh, an idea. Um, you know, I never played Time Bandit for the uh, PC. It's also for the ST. It's a cool game. It's uh, a game where you run around. There's two people controlling, and you're basically uh, um, shooting a bunch of things. But anyway, they had developed uh, um, a way to play their PC game. Anyone who played PC games back in the 80s probably knows all the joysticks were analog. Um, so, you know, games like Pac-Man and stuff like that didn't really play too well on them. Um, they had developed a way to uh, play um, their games with uh, Atari uh, joysticks by hooking them up through the parallel port. Um, the parallel port has five lines that you can read. Um, so you just map up to home the freight and the button to it. So simple design, but we uh, took that um, idea and um, put that support into all of our games so you could play um, all of our games with the Red Atari joystick too, which is kind of cool. So we call it the Champ Cable, and I still have like uh, 15 um, 
we had made a batch of like 50 back in like 1996. I sold like 15 in Franklin's interest in 1995 plus, plus shipping, but I could probably cut you, cut your break on it. So, um, actually, it's funny. Some guy actually about six months ago emailed me and asked if he could buy one for me, and I sold it to him. So, and I didn't give it a discount. <laughs> um, as far as how we deliver these games, um, we actually deliver them on three and a half inch floppies, so it kind of looked like a cartridge. A nice label printed, and uh, we had them uh, copy protected. Um, basically, just registered and had a registration file where you ordered it from us. We would register it, create a registration file, and then all we do is just display your name at the beginning. So it just uh, kind of, you know, if you gave it to someone, then your name would be all over it. So I'm sure it's easy to hack, but it was a it was a nice um, way to at least try to protect uh, people from just uh, sending it out everywhere. And uh, then eventually we also had a digital download as well. So we were ahead of the curve there. So um, people would just buy it on our site. We run the credit card and then uh, um, upload them or email them the, uh, the actual uh, the game. So. so here's a couple of screenshots of Kong, Miss Packer, and uh, Packer. And, uh, um, I don't know how we came up with Packham, but once that happened, then you had Miss Packham, Centipede, and it was just became like you know a mistake that you couldn't really get out, get away from. But Galaxia sounds kind of cool. Champ Kong, that was our our big one, so that was the one we really worked on. So here's Kong. It was like the screenshot. You can see uh, my graphic artist was pretty good, uh, um, so he kind of brought a good uh, a good flair to the uh, or professional polish to to this. So. Um, like I had mentioned before, it uh, includes four unique levels. And there you can see there's a quick screenshot of uh, one of the unique uh, levels. It's kind of based on the first one, but you can see the uh, girders are going the same way. So it adds a cool uh, dimension where the uh, barrels actually crisscross and stuff like that. So um, it was actually a really cool level that I probably should have shown that. It has like an elevator where the elevator opens and closes and you jump on it and you ride it to the top and stuff like that. So, um, and it's just Miss Packham. Uh, this one actually uh, had different mazes. It also has a um, a dot machine. So as you started to finish a level, a dot machine would come out and put more dots on there. So something that I didn't realize that actually happens in um, Junior Pac-Man, which I never played prior to making this. But so it was kind of cool. Uh, um, also like an ice cube you could hit. And, and actually, the unique thing about Jam Miss Packham is that it had a, a maze maker. Um, program in it where you can actually design your own mazes and save them and, and use them. So it was kind of ahead of the curve there. So it's Packham. Again, this one, um, we kind of just kept with this same maze, but it had uh, things like speed patches, transporters, um, and also uh, something I was inspired by, um, by a Bugs Bunny cartoon. It had those two light switches on the side of the uh, a maze where if you ran on the light switch, it would turn the maze on, and if a ghost ran over it, it would turn the maze off. Kind of, I don't know if you guys ever saw the cartoon where um, Bugs was with, uh, I don't know, Elmer, Fly was trying to get him or something like that. And they were in the, <laughs> in the uh, basement and they were both clicking the light, trying to get up the stairs, and then he faked turning the light off. And then, of course, Elmer falls down and breaks his neck. Or Anyways, so I was saying that's what inspired me. So you'd be a click and click, click, click. So you both clicking the thing. So <laughs> anyway, Galaxian, um, CM Galaxia, um, the champ is really fun. It's actually one of the one of the um, one of my favorite games is that um, because you could actually get power ups, it drop like weapon power ups and shield power ups, and uh, the um, some of the enemies would cloak, inspired by um, the Romulan ships from uh, Star um, Star Wars. I mean Star Trek. Um, where they cloak when they fly down, you can just see their eyes in the, uh, um, and some of them take up multiple shots to hit. So um, that's actually a lot of fun. All these games, by the way, are freeware um, in the public domain. And um, there's actually information if you're ever interested. You can still play them on, uh, on DOSBox and download them all from, um, uh, there's this guy uh, in Germany that has uh, put a fan site together about 20 years ago and it's still going. And so, it's actually working most of these screenshots because I, I don't have any of this stuff installed in there. But, um, and there's uh, his face too. This is shows like Champ Centipede, uh, Asterox, um, Invaders, and Galagon. 
And remember that word Galaga, so it comes back a couple of 20 years later. Um, gets re reincarnated on 2600. Um, anyway, so um, Centipede, I'm obviously was based off Centipede. Um, the uh, champ mode was kind of cool. So you actually had a triple fire, we could actually fire from the sides because you had snakes that would attack you from the side. I think I got those from Slither from uh, Coleco. I don't know if anyone's ever played Slither. It's kind of their cheap uh, centipede knockoff. Um, it also had a Black Widow though. So you had the regular spider, but the Black Widow would also come out and you would shoot a web and if he catches your um, shooter, you'd be stuck and you have to like wiggle out of it and stuff like that. So um, it had mosquitoes and stuff like that. So it was, uh, yeah, it's all it's kind of just an amp up version of Centipede. And, but you always also have the classic version if you want to play that. Asterox had Vector um, and uh, Raster uh, View or 3D um, um, Invaders. Plus, this one has like boss ships and uh, um, guided missiles and things like that. So, cool. It's just a, um, you know, Asteroid in itself can get a little boring. So, just uh, um, add a little pizzazz to it. There's invaders. Um, you can see uh, this is a uh, um, very uh, um, graphically enhanced um, champ mode right here. And this had like uh, um, enemies that would split and lay eggs that would hatch into more enemies and take multiple shots. And I fired something called a death laser too. You didn't want to get by that because that, uh, that would knock you out for sure. Um, <clears throat> then Champ Galagon was one of the last ones we made. Um, this actually used a different engine. I was, uh, we were considering moving towards direct action this time and doing Windows ports because DOS was kind of dying off. Um, so this was actually written in C++ and um, ran a little bit slower than the other games because of it, but um, it was just meant to be more flexible. So we did start a couple of the games, which I meant to put pictures of um, Frogum and Burger Climb, which were based on Frogger, Burger, Burger uh, Time. Um, those came out pretty good, but we ended up uh, stopping it. We ended up stopping at that one. So, so that was the uh, the champ programming days um, back in the nineties. Ninety eight, I ended up um, getting married and uh, buying uh, my mom's old house in a, um, an old Victorian. Um, had a job, had kids a couple years later, so I kind of put a the kibosh on this hobby and uh, classic development games. For a while, so that was uh, kind of why. And of course, with the um, advent of MAME, the demand for these types of ports, even though they're still fairly popular, um, didn't really seem to need anymore. The whole reason why I started doing it back in '93 is because I couldn't play Pac-Man on my PC. Um, by 1998, I could play Pac-Man 3,000, 4,000 other games, and now it's up to how many games? About 20,000, right? Um, so that wasn't wasn't really feeling a uh, uh, need anymore so I didn't really see see the point so but it was fun and it was uh, um, certainly a good time so um, as I mentioned before there are there's more info about champions on champum.com this guy Manfred Kramer he took uh, that EM and uh, put it into the name which I thought was kind of cool so but this has info on the complete history that I was just discussing um, and also some uh, exclusive pics of uh, Burger Climb and Frogham and as I said, I'd uh, released all these games into the public domain back in the early 2000s. So if you're interested, just download them, throw them in uh, DOSBox and uh, um, give them a shot. You might enjoy them. So. Anyway, so that was, uh, that was uh, the beginning of um, the classic game development. So in 2000, after my daughter was born, um, a friend of mine said, look, you're going to be very bored staying up all night. You know, keeping, because um, that was my shift. Um, so here, why don't you borrow my Atari 2600, which I hadn't played since 83, maybe? You know, once I once you moved on to the 800 and then DOS games, you know, who's going to play an Atari right. you know, 2600? I'm, I'm like, okay. So he gave it to me and I went home and I ended up falling back in love with it. It was like amazing. It's like uh, there, was, there I was at three in the morning, you know, in December of 2000 playing, uh, you know, uh, um, maze crates for the first time in 30 years or whatever it was. Uh, and then my buddies at work, we had them set up and we were playing combat during lunch. And all of a sudden we were all into the 20th turn again, you know, remembered why we fell in love with it to be with. So, um, of course, I'm still a developer at that point. And uh, 
this is a 2600 mountain range is still on the mind of like hey i want to learn how to do this kind of stuff so um that's where we're getting to the 2600 development so um started this vision this uh mailing list called the stella list i heard about because you know the internet was in full bloom by then right um so the Stella list was basically just a bunch of Atari enthusiasts that had gotten together to discuss all things Atari, mostly from a technical standpoint. And that's where they talked about you know all the nuances of the system, how to program it. Uh, that's where I was, uh, you know, you got links to the Stellar Programmer's Guide, which is basically just uh, a guide out there. It's actually a book now, which uh, I have a picture of here um, you can buy. That actually tells you, um, you know, the Atari registers how to get a basic kernel going and stuff like that. So that kind of piqued my interest. And I started just uh, messing around, and, you know, um, getting a dot on the screen, reading the joysticks, little silly things like that. Um, also, it was an exciting time for the 2600 as well because there were new prototypes being discovered, um, games that had started. We all heard about, heard about the big crash of 83, right? Um, where, you know, uh, you know, the whole video game, um, market crashed and you know all these businesses went out of they went out of business overnight and uh um a lot of games were in development and never got finished so um those are all being discovered games i had never played of you know all the really cool games in the late 80s and then all these new games these prototypes so there's a lot of excitement in the air um homebrews were starting to be developed for the atari and i think the first one was a tetris clone called ed tris um, back in 98 it was just, uh, um, that, I think that was the actual first one. Um, and then people started doing things like ports and uh, releasing some, maybe some original games. And again, um, also even redoing some old games that weren't done as well as people hoped they were being done. I'm talking to you, Pac-Man. <laughs> <laughs> that brings us here to, um, so here's an example of, uh, on the left is our Pac-Man image. I still remember this coming out. I remember a drawing on... Uh, my um, went to a Catholic school and drawing on my uh, um, one of my notepads, Pac-Man coming out March 1982, the actual date drawing, like there was like an advertisement. I was all excited about it and then I actually played it. Um, I remember not being that upset by it, thinking, you know, by then, back then, we all just thought that's the best Atari could do. Still didn't really understand a lot of the design decisions, but, you know, we still played it. Anyway, um, on the left is obviously the original one. On the right is um, a friend of mine, Dennis DeGro, who's one of the uh, um, other developers that I met back in the early 2000s that um, kind of helped me out to get started. That's his version of that. And you see it looks almost like the, exactly like the arcade. Um, it's also in 4K. His, uh, you know, a lot of my games I do now, it's 32K. It's using ARM processors and stuff like that. So I'm cheating as people would, some people would say, but it's not really cheating, just using the, the latest technology. But Dennis wanted to prove that given enough time and, you know, um, effort, um, he obviously didn't have any, uh, the same, um, um, what do you call it, uh, timelines that uh, Todd Fry had to make his. I think Todd Fry had like six weeks to do this or eight weeks, whatever it was. But Dennis proved that in 4K, he could make a, a Pac-Man you know, almost looks and sounds exactly like the arcade. So imagine how excited we all would have been if this would have come out instead, right? So anyway, so, and then there's actually another one made by this user called Dintari, which is used, uses 8K, actually has like spot on arcade sound and has all the intermissions and stuff like that. So again, it's not using the ARM processor, it's not using any extra RAM. So it's still a very impressive, uh, um, I think Todd Fry, we, we all know who Todd Fry is, one of these guys. Anyway, so I think he originally wanted 8K, um, but you know, Atari is, if they go 8K, then cartridge is gonna cost an extra dime and they're gonna lose X amount of dollars when they sold a million of these things. So they made them squeeze them into 4K. So that's, so I've met Todd. I actually met him at one of the Portland Gaming Expos and spoke to him specifically about this and he played the new one and he was very impressed. You know, most of these guys, when you talk to them, they don't look at you in jealousy. Well, they look at you jealous wise, but not in a, you know, you're making me look bad. It's more like, I wish I had what you had, you know? So, um, so it's always nice and like Dave Crane and stuff like that. And I'll talk about him later because he's, he's an inspiration for some of the, the new stuff. He was a 
he was a cutting edge guy. He wasn't a, you know, I'm going to do everything 2K to prove that I can do the 2K. He was like, give me 8K, give me 2K extra RAM, give me a custom chip, whatever I need to make the best game possible. And that's kind of what, that's, that's the mantra that Champ Games follows. And again, I don't, I don't put anyone down who doesn't want to do that. Because a lot of people want to say, what could I have done in 1982 using stock hardware and, and uh, not even just hardware, but using something that could have been not only made, but also produced back then. Because, you know, even if you could do a 32K game with 4K RAM back then, the game would have cost $200, you know. So if you could make it, you can't sell it. So um, they had that balance. We don't have that. Um, because I don't have that issue, you know. If it's a 2K game or 128K game, it costs the same to put on the cartridge for us. So anyway, so so what is a homebrew? So that'll lead us directly into this. So so that's basically I should say right away that um, a lot of this um, demonstration up to a lot of these slides are given to me by Daryl Spite. Uh, if you know who he is, he's uh, another um, home developer. Um, he's done um, similar presentations like this, probably like 20 or 30 over the, maybe not that many, but he's done a bunch. And so he lent me some of his things so I didn't have to reinvent the wheel. So I'll give him credit where credit's due, but I did modify you know, modify them to suit our needs here today. So, um, so anyway, so obviously a homebrew is just something that someone makes by themselves for a system that typically doesn't offer that as you know a uh, feasible way to program for them. Um, there's been hundreds of these released for the Atari 800. I mean, for the Atari 2600. And other systems as well, 5200, the 800, the 7800, Jaguar. Some guy was bugging me out there about a Jaguar. I never played a Jaguar. Um, but, um, and then um, most of these games, or all, all uh, good fortune games are available through atariage.com. That's run by uh, Alan Uriso. Um, he, uh, He's been involved with the Atari um, scene since 2001. Him and his buddy um, Alex started AtariAge.com. That's been that was also a good way um, or an inspiration for people to bring the Atari community together to discuss not only the games they love but also um, you know where these prototypes are discovered, uh, where games were being developed and shared, and, you know, the community. So it's uh, you know that's why a lot of us are here. A lot of it's, it's, it's a community thing too. It's not just about the game. It's about, you know, discussing and hanging out with guys that love the same things that you did when you were a kid and still have some kind of a affection for this stuff, right? So, anyway, so we're just going to go through. Uh, 2006, I started on developing, um, it was actually 2005. Um, I was inspired to start my first um game for the 2600, and it was uh, a port of Caverns of Mars. And I don't know if anyone's played that for the 800. Um, I was actually, I shouldn't say sanctioned by Atari, but um, I'll just let you guys look these screenshots real quick, uh, and then we'll just jump here. So um, in, 80, in 2005, Atari released um, the Flashback 2. I don't know if we're familiar with the Flashback system, but that's basically a way for uh, Atari to introduce their classic game systems to the newer generation, you know, because they are kind of look like Ataris, but they're emulators somewhat, and they hook up to real TVs, or because, you know, the systems out there, you know, and, well, um, Whitney, you, you were helping me out there. It took us, you know, who knows how long to hook up, you know, a real system to a real, <laughs> that took us, took us like an hour to hook up, you know, the RF switches and the TV switch, and. Put on channel three, we can't change it. Oh my God, you know, so um, obviously no one's gonna buy them, but that's what you have. So the Flashback one was actually a Nintendo on a chip, um, which I had played. It was, it was, well, just, it, it was terrible. I thought it was terrible. But um, the second one was made by Legacy Engineering by Kurt Lindell. Um, Kurt unfortunately passed away, he had a heart attack uh, uh, about a year ago. So rest, rest his soul. But um, before that, he did a, a lot of great things for Atari. Um, and uh, he had actually um, salvaged a lot of their stuff from their Sunnyvale um, um, offices. So, you know, um, he's um, a founder of the Atari Museum and he has all prototype stuff. He has documents. He had, had all this stuff. 
and he was also a pretty good engineer, and he developed the Flashback 2. The Flashback 2 is actually a um, Atari on the chip, a real Atari that he designed. So it's um, even though it's not completely a hardware, 100% hardware match, it was not emulation. So it has an actual Atari, and um, so the games actually played like they would on a real Atari um, sound, except there, like I said, there were some nuances. Uh, he also made it hackable where he made it so um, if you could, if you wanted to open it, he had the, the leads so you could put on a cartridge board, which actually I should have put a picture of mine. Actually, I can't do it. I'm not a hardware guy. Um, but some guy did it for me where in the center there, he put a cartridge port so you could put a real cartridge in and play it off of it. So it's kind of cool. So anyway, so they had, um, when they released the Flashback 2, they put on a bunch of the Atari IPs. And as part of that, they put on um, some IPs that they had that they hadn't made before. So what they did is they had a uh, Chinese company, nothing against the Chinese or the developers, but they don't know how to program for the Atari. Um, <laughs> They put together a version of Cavern's Mars, which was terrible. So I bought this thing back in uh, the summer of uh, 2005, wanting to play Cavern's Mars, one of my favorite 100 games, and it was thoroughly disappointed. So anyway, I reached out to Kurt and I said, hey, you know, I'm not a big programmer, but um, a lot of these games, Lunar Lander, Cavern's Mars, Yars Return, which is a um, follow-up to Yars Revenge, you know, they're lacking. Um, maybe you could have some of the homebrew developers help you out. He goes, well, you have any ideas? I'm like, well, I'll give it a shot. You know, I love Cabins of Mars. Let me see what I can do. So a couple of weeks, I put together a, uh, a prototype that showed that it could be done almost exactly the 800 version, which he was impressed. I was impressed, too, because it was the first time I'd done Atari programming. Um, not pat myself on the back, but um, it was, uh, I thought it came out pretty good. I was like, and he loved it. So, um, so we finished it, and um, unfortunately, Atari was being sold again, and um, uh, AT Games ended up buying them. So they ended up discontinuing the uh, um, Flashback 2 Plus that was going to be. And they went back to emulator Nintendo on the chip, starting with um, 3. And eventually they ended up going to Stella, in, which is another emulator, a much better one, eventually. Um, I, think it's, I think so anyway, because they're up to like Flashback 11 or something like that. Um, but anyway, so um, that's, that was the story of um, Caverns of Mars, why it was developed. It was originally developed for Atari, it had an Atari copyright on it. Um, but I spoke to Kurt, he said, look, um, you're not going to be able to release it here, so why don't you just rebrand it, sell it through Atari, it does Conquest of Mars. So, so we changed a few of the graphics, changed the name. Um, I added a bunch of little new features to it as well. And that was the first game I, that I released in 2006. Um, Ladybug was the second game I made, and that I started off in January of 2006. This was inspired by my mother as well. Not only did she like to buy me um, games, she also loved to play them. Um, and my mom, was a, she was quite a hoot because she would want to play at night. She was a night owl, and she was a smoker, and a coffee drinker. And I'd be sitting there, it was my senior year of high school, I remember, and I needed to get some sleep. But she's in my room, you know, with a bathrobe, and... Uh, smoking and <laughs> drinking her coffee and, uh, and and she had she had a sailor's mouth a nice way to say it <laughs> and she loved pac-man she would be playing atari um uh, pac-man for the 800 and she'd be like oh great bastard <laughs> so she's like uh, she's swearing some of that so she loves pac-man um so then my um over the summer a friend of mine you know you always had that friend that had the coleco vision the rich friend or, or the 5200. So he lent me his Coleco for a week and Ladybug was, um, I'd never played it. So we played that and tell my mom loved it. So this is Pac-Man with a, you know, a girl's scene to it. So Ladybug was her absolute favorite. So she was, you know, she was playing that same type of thing. Of course, she has to struggle with the uh, ColecoVision controllers, uh, which are really What the hell is all, with these controllers? Yeah, you know, exactly. I can barely sleep, you know. I'm like, Mom, I really need to sleep. So anyway, so she asked the famous question. So um, so that was it. So friend let me borrow it. And um, Coleco had actually planned to release 20th Center. You know, I had gotten a few of the Coleco games for the Atari 20th Center. And one of the um, um, pamphlets said, coming soon, Ladybug for your Atari 20th Center. So my mom famously asked the question, why can't I play Ladybug on the Atari? One mom, you'll be able to play soon, making it. 
She went, oh, okay, good, good. <laughs> What's your name? So anyway, so in 2006, that kind of stuck with me. So in, in, her, in her memory, I, uh, I started it and I developed it and uh, ended up releasing it about six months later. So, um, so it's dedicated to her. And uh, that one actually came out pretty good. It was one of those games I started and a lot of the uh, um, Cabin to Mars I developed in secret because it was supposed to be just released on the, on the flashback. Um, so I didn't get any feedback from other developers for that one. Um, but Ladybug was different because uh, that one I kind of posted my ideas. And that was, that's a good thing about the Atari Age forums that there's a lot of uh, interaction and community feedback to say, hey, this is going to work, this is going to work. So first thing they said is like, there's no way you can do it. There's not enough memory. You can't do this. You can't store all the doors, things. And immediately I came up with a way to do it using the stock 16K um, and um, the 128 bytes of RAM. Um, that's the big limiting factor with the Atari. Um, if you're not going to use, uh, um, this was before the ARM, and before uh, Al had cartridges that had like the super chip would give you more RAM, stuff like that. Didn't have any of that. So if you wanted to make a game and release it, you had to keep it 4K, 8K, 16K, and the standard stock 120 bytes of RAM. Um, so I did come up with a unique solution just to not have the uh, doors. I don't know if I just played Ladybug, but um, basically you flip the doors. So the first concession I made is that the doors would have to flip symmetrical on each side because you couldn't draw the way the Atari works. Different, um, you know, it had to be symmetrical for it to uh, to draw properly. Plus you couldn't store all the information anyway. So anyway, so it's a Ladybug ended up getting released. And right now I think it's sitting number four all the time on the Atari uh, sales. So of 15 years, so um, touch pretty good out of hundreds of games. So I think it's being beat by uh, Halo 2600. I don't know if you guys ever heard, but the guy that worked on Halo actually made Halo for the 2600. Wow. Yeah, it's a 4K game. It's pretty good, but you know, the name recognition, yeah. you, know, you know, who's gonna, I'm gonna play Ladybug. No, I'm gonna play Halo. <laughs> it's cool. And this other game, Juno Purse, and then actually this thing called Synth Car. I don't even know what it is, but something with making music on the Atari. That's number one. Go figure. But I didn't make a music thing too, so I'm, I'll see what we do about Synth Car. Um, anyway, so as you can see, Scramble is 2016. So now we have a 10 year gap. 2006 to 2016 just happened to be when my kids were five and six up to the time they don't want to talk to me anymore. So, <laughs> so I was, yeah, exactly. So I was being, I was playing dad for whatever, seven or eight years. And uh, actually I did get back into it. Um, in 2014, we did release a collector's edition of Ladybug because um, Ladybug was supposed to be released on the Coleco, I mean, by Coleco. And there had always been a lot of uh, requests for Al to release Ladybug in a ColecoVision cart with ColecoVision box, kind of a what if scenario. That's the thing about the Atari. Um, not only is a, a good thing for making games, it's also great for collecting. Um, and people, uh, a lot of people just like to collect stuff. So they want to fill in their thing and say, okay, next to Donkey Kong for the um, Atari, here's Ladybug in a ColecoVision box and shells so like that. So I said, hey, this is easy for me, easy money, right? So we made a uh, hundred of them and they're all individually uh, um, watermarked um, when you start up. So it's a zero, zero out of 99. Um, and it does come in a click official. And I changed the title screen. I think that was it. So, but it was a good way to get back in Atari because I had to kind of reteach myself, like find my code and, you know, figure out how to even just do that little part. Um, but that was good. So. Anyway, so we did that, and as part of it, we actually uh, distributed a, um, a remake of the catalog that um, advertised Ladybug. Um, so one thing that we did is, uh, when we saw that, there was another game that was being advertised called Cosmic Avenger. Are there any ColecoVision fans here? Okay, so we know what Cosmic yeah, Avenger is, right? Avenger. Exactly. I always liked it. Like I said, I only played ColecoVision a few times. That was one of my favorite ones. I went, hey, let's, let's make Cosmic Avenger. This would be great. It would be another one we could do. So we started on it. Um, so there's a, there's a scramble right there. It's, this is the one we did reason to how we got to scramble. If you remember back from my mountain range description, it was inspired by scramble. 
because I had to scramble into Sunnyside Farms next to me that uh, I'd spent way too much money at when I was a kid. And back then, way too much money was like three dollars, right? Um, <laughs> but anyway, so it's causing adventures. So scrambled to pour the '81 Konami game, and it was um, started in 2016 after my 10 year hiatus. I did do a few proof of concepts back in like 2007, which we'll discuss later. Um, but we were inspired to do Cosmic Avenger. And you can see there's actually a screenshot of what I started with Cosmic Avenger. Um, doesn't look too bad. But um, this is when I was coerced to the dark side. That's the ARM development that we'll get into. Um, and that's why all the um, later games like Scramble and Super Cobra and stuff like that, you'll see the, they're all going to start looking a little bit more like Nintendo games. That's because they're using an ARM processor um, on the cartridge that um, does a lot of uh, back-end processing. To m in my defense, they are still Atari games in the sense that no matter what you do before the screen and after the screen, you're still using the Atari TIA to draw the screen, which means you still have 76 cycles, you still have two player sprites, two missiles, a ball, and a very low resolution play field. That's all you have. No matter what you do before that, it all has to be squeezed in through that, and that's what you're going to see on the screen. So. Um, but I'm not going to belittle the arm itself. What you, it can do in that um, the vertical blank before the screen is drawn and over scan after it's drawn helps immensely with yeah. setting up data. Yeah. Plus, you have more ROM. You have 32k of ROM, and you also have 6k of RAM. Um, but we'll get into. I have a technical discussion tomorrow if you're interested, which gets more into that. Um, that'll talk about. Uh, um, how the arm works with the atari and how the extra ram is used the atari itself does not have a frame buffer it doesn't have a video buffer where you can uh, just uh you know plot and screen and show it you know it's all it's called racing the beam there's actually a very good development book out there called racing the beam which um details how when the TV screen is being drawn line by line that's how the atari you actually change your registers on the fly in real time. And based on what's in those registers, what gets drawn on the screen. So if you don't change them, your screen doesn't change. And the line doesn't change. So you have to change, so you can change them all the time per line, once per line, different colors, different sizes, stretch it, shift it, move it. Um, and that's how you trick the target into to showing you some, something. Um, so anyway, so why did we just scramble in that Cosmic Avenger? A, I only played it a couple of times. I'm not a huge fan, but I do think it's kind of cool, and it is on the list. Um, Scramble is something I played probably a million times. I remember, I mean, actually, that's one of the games I actually dreamed of in the 90s. Like, I played it early in the 80s. I hadn't played it forever. It wasn't until I played it on Main like 15 years later, but one of those games where I always wanted to play it. And um, so um, since we wanted to do a scrolling game, that was the big thing. Um, I said, well, let's just do Scramble because I know this one like the back of my hand and the game actually plays fairly close to Scramble. So, so anyway, so once we did Scramble, the only, the next logical, uh, um, this is where I pulled uh, Dennis DeBrow and decided to write the wrong that was a uh, Super Cobra on the 2600. <laughs> and again, I'm not going to put, put it down because considering the resources that they had, I think they did pretty good, but Sometimes games just shouldn't be attempted on the Atari, at least not um, without the proper tools. So I remember playing Super Cobra for the Atari 2600 and saying, this is just terrible. Um, and it's not because the programmer, it's just the game is just not suited for this, this uh, thing. But um, we uh, decided that since we just did Scramble, let's do Super, Super Cobra. I thought it was just going to be an easy hack. No, so much. Just because Scramble, I barely fit in 32K. Super Cobra is twice as big as 10 levels instead of five. Um, so we had to get very creative. We actually used a different bank switching scheme um, called CDF, um, which actually stands for Chris, Daryl, and Fred, who are the three engineers that designed it. Um, so, uh, Scramble is actually DPC plus, and that's an extension of DPC, which was actually used for Pitfall 2. Again, that's all in technical discussion, so I won't bore you with those right now, but. Um, so Super Cobra CDF gave us four more K and actually I worked with the guy 
Thomas Yentz, who's also a very uh, prolific uh, 2600 developer, um, homeroom developer. And we came up with a um, um, compression scheme. I should say he did, and I implemented it to fit all the levels um, so they're um, decompressed on the fly. And also, um, I should mention Nathan Strong, who's a, a guy who's been with me since my first 2600 game and does all my graphics. Um, between him and Daryl, let's see, he's, this is 2600 builder I'm talking about, too. Um, they actually developed a way to, he took screenshots of all the main levels of Super Cobra, stitched them together into one huge um, graphic, and then reduced the image um, resolution so it matched the Atari. And Daryl came up with a, um, a utility based on the color of, you know, so if there was a fuel depot here, he put a red dot and a blue dot for artillery thing, and obviously the terrain, stuff like that. It converted all that into the data for the levels. And then Tom, Thomas Yentz, um, developed a compression routine to take all that data and put it into a compressed form. And then I wrote the utilities to convert it all into actual what you see on the screen. So literally these levels are exactly the same. And we, he did that right before a super um, scramble was released. So um, he was, Nathan was inspired to go back and even though the scramble ones are pretty close, he didn't redid them. And, uh, you know, just screenshots, stitch them all together. We ran into the utility. So scramble and super cover, the actual levels are pixel perfect representations of uh, the main version. So, um, Man, what people do for a 2600 game. <laughs> exactly. So, anyway, so here's um, this is uh, it's called Super Cobra Arcade to distinguish it from the original release for the 2600. And you can see once I did this and I opened up Pandora's box, and people were like, oh, can you do a arcade version of XYZ? Blah, blah, blah. So, you'll see that that'll be a theme for a few of my games where, you know, games that I enjoy, but aren't really fun on the Atari for whatever version, for whatever reason, uh, get redone in this arcade flair. So there's the uh, Parker Brothers version on the left. Very sad. Um, so actually the worst part about it is the, uh, the movement is very, very jerky. Mine's, uh, even though the sc you can't do anything about the scrolling because it's a very low resolution, 40 pixel wide uh, um, um, play field. Um, it still scrolls pretty well. Um, but the chopper movement was really bad in the, um, the uh, Parker Brothers version. Um, but um, we corrected that with one. So, anyway, so, so after that, um, we moved on to Mappy. Mappy was a game I played back in the day, um, but um, um, I had played it first on the uh, um, PlayStation. And this, this was an interesting game because this one, um, we also used a CFJ. Um, um, bank switching, um, which again is an extension of the DPC chip developed by David Crane for Pitfall 2. That's why I show a picture of Pitfall 2 here. And the reason why I'm mentioning that is because um, the, TP, the DPC chip um, added a couple things to um, Pitfall. It added extra RAM and a fast writing mode. Um, it takes a long time for a line to update a sprite in Atari. Um, especially if it's going to be dynamic and be changing every night. It takes like 20 cycles, 21. And that doesn't sound like a lot, but when you only have 76 for the entire line, 21 for one sprite, now you're at 42, and but you don't have any bolts left yet. You don't have any loop management yet. You don't have the play field right yet. So there's really not a lot of time to do stuff. But Pitfall, it, um, David Crane had developed this chip that allowed him to do um, dynamic writes in seven um, cycles. So that really added to the extra enhanced graphics in Pitfall. Additionally, he developed a, um, a three voice a music driver um, that played in the um, Atari has two sound, sound channels. Um, um, so he plays a three voice harmonized um, um, background track on one of the um, Ch um, one of the uh, channels and then uh, all the sound effects in another one. So the reason why I'm mentioning that is because Mappy uses that same DPC music for its music. If you get a chance, um, it is set up out there. You can definitely tell that the TIA music is notoriously bad and out of tune 
because it's basically just doing waveforms at certain intervals. So you may have a C note, but you don't have a D. You have a D sharp, and your E is really, really flat, and you don't even have, you know, the third um, octave for the, the G, you know. And so it's, there's only so much you can do with music with for the regular TIA um, sound. That's why uh, Atari music isn't that good. So, so for the uh, for a Mappy, we were able to use real music. Um, and for that project, we actually developed a uh, MIDI to uh, DPC. Well, I, I developed it. Um, utility that would actually take MIDI music and then convert it into DPC music and then play it in it. So that was cool. So, so Mappy was kind of cool. Um, and actually, it's a pretty fun game as well. So it's become one of my favorites. So and, uh, um, I think that's one that people enjoy them, enjoy a lot. So um, after that, um, we went to Wizard of War Arcade, and this is a uh, um, again a rewrite of Wizard of War, which was released by CBS in the early '80s. Um, I'm a big Wizard of War fan. I used to play on the 800 with my brothers all the time, um, but the 26 turn version is really really bad. Um, the biggest problem being is that it's only 4K, and they didn't use any. Uh, Sprite on reuse, so um, it's very, very flickery, very difficult. And someone, I have bad eyesight to begin with, so um, running that was, uh, um, playing that was never fun. So I always wanted to rewrite that one. I started that in 2007, um, and ended up disbanding after I took a nine or 10 years off. Um, but I ended up revisiting it back in uh, 2019. Um, using this new CDFJ driver. Um, one of the cool things that we're able to add, and one of the reasons I'm glad I waited as well, is that um, there's an um, item called the Atari box that uh, has been developed um, by um, Richard Hutchinson, I think it's the same. Um, this is actually a cool device, hooks up to one of the joystick ports and allows you, it's basically a speech, uh, um, system, um, that system I don't want to talk about, but anyway, it allows you to play speech through the, uh, the Atari. Um, so Wizard of War, the arcade game is famous for its speech. So, um, we were able to, um, develop, um, a way to have it play speech in game up to 60 phrases actually. So it's kind of cool. And, um, another thing that we developed for this, I worked with, um, Bite the Chili, uh, Productions, um, it's a guy that does some other home development and also dabbles in hardware. And we developed this thing called the Quad Tari. It's the, uh, that picture. I actually have one here. Allows you to hook up four joysticks to an Atari. The reason why we did that is because another um, selling point of Wizard War is that it's a two player game. Um, we were kind of in a conundrum with the Atari box because the Atari box takes up one of the joystick ports. So we wanted to be able to offer, you know, a true arcade experience for the player, which would be two player co-op with voice. Only way to do that would be to allow more than two joysticks to be hooked into the system. So we developed this quad Tari, which is a generic, um, basically just has multiplexers in the middle. It's controlled by software, which allows you to read um, up to four joysticks, two on each port, um, based on whether the paddle line is high or not. It's kind of a unique uh, solution that we came up with, but, um, Anyway, for it was developed really for Wizard of War, but it's going to be it can be used for other games, which I'll explain later. Um, so you can hook up two joysticks to two of the ports, the Atari box to the other one, and bingo, you have a two-player simultaneous voice. So Wizard of War also um, I borrowed uh, one of my ideas from my old uh, Miss Packham days in DOS, and this one has a built-in maze the first of its kind for the Atari, the ability to uh, create your own maze um, using um, the joystick and pressing the button to draw the walls. And you can actually save those to the Atari box. Which also mentioned the Atari box also has the ability to save data to it as well. So all the games I've mentioned up from Scramble on um, support the Atari box um, for um, saving high scores. Um, and other game settings, and in Wizard of War's um, example, um, the actual mazes you've created, so up to three, so, so it's kind of cool. 
and uh, and if, they, if it makes sense, we'll use the points as well too. So um, after that, we developed what people thought was impossible for the Atari, and that was a port of Galaga for the Atari. Um, it's something I started back in March of 2019 as a proof of concept. I was inspired by Galaxian by the Atari because Galaxian does something similar where it's able to draw the entire um, fleet of uh, enemies using just one player sprite. How do you do that? Um, well, that's in the technical session. Um, but it is actually a very unique way to do it. So I disassembled um, Galaxian and said, well, Galaxian was written just an assembly. It did have 16K though, and extra RAM. So um, I think an actual decent Galaga clone could be done without using the arm. But I just said that, probably to make myself feel better. <laughs> to quiet, quiet, quiet the haters. But certainly um, 32K ROM and the extra RAM, you put a lot more bells and whistles, that's for sure. Which I should note that a lot of the ROM and extra stuff that I use is really for bells and whistles. Um, there are particular games where it actually is used for the game itself, where the game would not be the same without it. Mappy being one of them. Um, and Scramble. The problem is that scrolling an entire screen can take up the entire frame, like all your processing just to do that. So to be able to have the arm do the scrolling for you saves, um, leaves a lot of uh, um, extra time to do the things you really need to do, like you know, collision detection and moving things, stuff like that. So anyway, as you can see, so Galaga, I was able to basically put the entire um, arcade game in there with all the cut scenes and um, the music was done by this guy, Ross Keenum. This is actually you know, one of the lucky things. Uh, usually what I'll do is I'll start a game and um, then I'll scramble to find out. First, I got to convince Nathan to do the graphics. He's a big Galaga fan, so that was easy. Usually what I'll do is I'll Right, do my own graphics. They look terrible. And how he'll be like, oh, okay, John, put down the pen, take two steps back, and let me take it from here. Then he'll uh, he'll do his amazing graphics. And then um, I need to find some guy to do the sound because I'm a, a great sound guy. Um, but luckily for me, this guy, Ross Keenum, had done all the sounds back in 2011, um, but wasn't a developer. He was just a music guy. And they were buried in the Atari's forum when someone found them. So I reached out to him and he said, yeah, use the sounds. And he did a few that we were missing as well, like the high score tunes and stuff like that. So he's credited for it. And uh, so in like uh, eight weeks, we were able to put together a uh, um, pretty good version of Galaxy. So that's it. So here's just a quick screenshot um, of the Galaxian. You can see Galaxian. I'm still not sure why Atari put that border around there. Um, but there are hacks of Galaxian for Atari where they've taken that border out. And, they made the uh, um, images look a little bit more like the arcades. So that's good. Um, and then there's uh, Champ Galagon on the right. That name sounds familiar, right? So um, usually we use the same name, which I know we probably shouldn't be doing anyway. But Al was a little nervous about using Galaga since it's such a high profile name um, in, this, in his store. I mean, to sell it. So we said, well, let's just use the same name that he used back in the 90s. So. Um, Anyway, so that's why, and as it turns out, um, since Galaga and these games are written, um, I don't know if I mentioned that, but a lot of the game logic is written in C that runs on the ARM. Galaga is written in C. So I was actually able in the resolution, um, VGA is 320 by 200, on um, the resolution for an Atari is 160 by 200. So I was able to use a lot of the pattern data and just divide everything by two. And it was actually pretty amazing. That's why I was able to put together in eight weeks a lot of the logic. I just found my old source code, dug it out, kind of copied it over. Obviously, it didn't work. You know, there's no C libraries or anything down on the arm. Um, but I was able to use a lot of logic. The pattern data almost uh, um, ported over exactly. So that was a nice bonus, especially all the challenge stages. I was able to just port those in. And first time I ran them. Mm -hmm. A little bit of a tweak here and there, and we were ready to go. So that was good. So, um, should also mention that Galaga has a cool, uh, I um, added its co op mode in it, which allows you to have two players at the same time playing. It's kind of neat. So, uh, actually, what you have 
one guy that's moving, and then every eight seconds the control changes. But if you get captured, you get pulled to the top, and the other guy has to come in and save you. And if he saves you, then you get a double ship, and then each one of you separately controls one of the ships. So it's kind of a unique twist on a, a co-op mode. So it actually is a lot of fun if you get a chance to play. So, but again, that's why uh, the Quadri would be a great addition to that because it allows you to play a co-op mode and still have your save key hooked up for um, high scores. Yeah. Up next was Zookeeper. This is a game I never played back in the day. Um, I did play on name. Um, one of the unique. Uh, um, it's hard. It's hard to see here, but you can see out there is there's a. Uh, the play field actually looks like a set of bricks, which people didn't think was possible. Um, it's actually a trick where if you alternate coloring the play field on alternating frames like this and like that, it's a little complicated to explain. It actually, it's almost like um, an artifact is drawn between where you're drawing, which makes it look like they're separate bricks. Um, I, you know, I was inspired by actually, uh, um, when we were doing the Mappy logo, just doing that five color logo was, I had a, a rainbow one that was set up for a while. And um, we ended up doing this last minute, um, but we did uh, end up getting the five color mode. Anyway, we were trying to make the M a little bit larger at one point, and we had to alternate half the M on one frame and the other, and I saw the line, and that inspired me to start Zookeeper, because I said, wait, that could be used for brick. And a couple of weeks later, I had a prototype of Zookeeper running. Um, of course, the brick part was the easiest part. <laughs> um, getting 16, um, um, what do you call it, animals running around in a circle and you know uh, all the other nuances of new Zookeeper working proved to be quite uh, challenging. But uh, that was that's um, how one sometimes is a little, um, Accent from one game can inspire another. So then we move on to Avalanche. Now, this one's only 4K. Um, this is a game I wrote back in a week in 2007 and then finished it up in 2020. Um, this is a game I just wanted to do. Um, basically, I was working with Kurt again. He was working on some idea about releasing TVs with a flashback built into it, some hair rate scheme. And he's like, uh, you know, it's through Atari, so it's like, go through the Atari catalog and see if you can make some simple games um, for this thing. So I just went to the killer list of video games. I don't know if you guys have ever remembered that. It's just basically just a, you know, a resource out there with all the video games. Um, and uh, so I went there and the first thing I saw from Atari was Avalanche, so I had never even played the game. But interesting, this is the big inspiration behind Kaboom. Um, and, uh, so I quickly uh, whipped up what I thought it would be like. Um, you can see it's basically just rocks falling and you're ca ch catching them with uh, paddles. Um, so it's a very simple, basic game, but it is the inspiration behind Kaboom and something that we uh, um, use the paddles. So it was a good opportunity for me to, to learn something different. So, and uh, that's, um, that was something we finished up and, and released as well. So uh, if you're interested in playing that one. So, and then the last game that we've released actually um, is available for the first time tonight is Robot War 2684, which is obviously a clone of Robotron 2084. This is a game no one thought was possible in the Atari. Actually, I think Atari um, tried to develop this back in the 80s, and it was a flickering mess, um, probably because they were trying to draw all the grunts using player sprites, which is um, pretty crazy when you only have two sprites to use. So I quickly made a decision that um, the only way you're going to be able to do this is if you wrote, drew the um, um, grunts using the play field. And the grunts move in chunks anyway, so it worked out pretty good. You actually lose some of the resolution, they're just squares, but they are multicolored and they look kind of cool. Um, and I also draw the electrodes, which are the squares that, you, that stun you. Um, so I'll alternate those on each frame so I can get different colors. Um, and the good news is I can draw you know, that's 80, some, you can see that bottom screen there, there's like 80 of them there with no flicker at all, at all. at least no perceived flicker because everything does flicker at 30 hertz, but since it's constant, you can, it doesn't look like it's flickering at all. So then that just left the player's price to uh, 
to draw everything else, which you know, your guy and the, um, I do use the ball and the missile and the, yeah, even the play field to draw some of the missiles that go left and right. So considering on uh, some of the levels, there's up to a hundred things on the screen at once moving. Um, a lot of the work I did for this was just optimizing collision routines and even with the arm, because the arm only runs during vertical blank and overscan. You have 262 lines and 208 of them are being drawn, which you're only supposed to do 192. I always push the envelope and I draw a little bit more than you're supposed to, but I think 208 is the absolute top. Um, so you only have like 50 lines where the arm is actually running. So even though you have a 70 megahertz processor, effectively it's only like nine or 10 megahertz because it's only running for, you know, whatever that is, 18% of the time, not even that, it's 15% of the time. So, but still, um, we're able to, um, this, this is uh, using the, uh, the quadratory as well, because um, it does support the dual joysticks where you can move with one and fire with the other. This also has a co-op mode, a true co-op mode, where you have two guys on the screen at all times. Um, and so that allows you to hook up four joysticks, have each player using um, two joysticks each. So, so that's uh, kind of cool. There's actually a picture of me running a robot war on my large screen TV with uh, two handmade uh, dual controllers, bungee cords and uh, a couple pieces of wood. And uh, actually one of them is a uh, 3D printed um, joystick holder that some guy made for me at Atari age, um, but all hooked up to the quad Atari and into the, uh, um, the Atari itself. So anyway, so, and it does use the uh, sound from the Atari 700, 7800 version. That's one good thing is that the 7800 and the Atari 2600 use the same uh, sound chip, TIA chip. So I was able to borrow it. And that's actually one thing I did. Uh, <laughs> I wrote a little routine that actually went through the 20, the 7800 code, found the tables where the sounds were and actually ripped it out. <laughs> so, but I did ask the guy if I could use it. He said, yeah, go. <laughs> so, <laughs> Anyway, I might know I'm probably really, really over here, but um, there's only a few more, I promise. So anyway, so those are the 10 games that we have available out there um, to play. Um, we also have, um, as I was talking about before, there's, uh, you know, these hack programs in the 80s did their games, and then I feel like I have to come along and do the arcade version to undo you know, the justice. <laughs> so I kind of did it to myself this time because, um, coming soon is uh, we play out there is Ladybug Arcade finally undo the abomination of Champ Games 2006 version. I'm kidding, of course. Um, but um, I did um, for the 15th anniversary of Ladybug. Um, I did redo it. When I say redo. I uh, um, used uh, the arm to uh, enhance the graphics. The you know, maze is uh, now a true 11 by 11 maze. Um, it has a uh, high score support, it has uh, actually two player mode, it has um, um, co-op mode, uh, I mean versus mode, where one guy can actually control the, uh, the uh, insects, it has multiple mazes, um, we read it on the graphics, um, so it, the uh, um, status display is more arcade-like, so it's kind of a, it's a pretty good uh, um, update to the original. Um, but it does use, and the biggest thing is that since that we have more RAM, um, the doors don't have to be symmetrical anymore. So it now has 24 um, independent doors that can flip on their own. Though I did add it, so if you put it into difficulty A, it can go back to the original symmetrical way if you want to play it like that as well. Um, so, and as I mentioned, it has multiple mazes as well. So, um, so yeah, so it's a cool update that's uh, coming out I think in December. So. Um, we also, um, a lot of these games are inspired by, uh, like Nathan, um, these guys that help me out. If they like a game, they'll suggest something. And Gorf is his favorite game, so he asked that uh, I try to uh, update Gorf. Um, Gorf did come off of the Atari um, back in the 80s, but it was kind of plain, only in four of the levels. Um, so we've done uh, an arcade version that um, also uses the Atari box. Gorf is famous for its voice. So this has all 30 arcade phrases. Actually, Nathan did the arcade phrases for that one. So that's very helpful for me. So um, 
you can play that out there as well. And that has the actual relaxing stage as well, which I know is omitted from most of the home versions. So um, that's, uh, that's, that one actually, it's come along pretty well. So we're hoping to plan to release that one um, ne next year. Um, and the left is a uh, Turbo Arcade. Um, Turbo was actually never released officially for the Atari, though it was planned by Coleco, another one that they didn't do. Uh, Prototype was discovered back in the late um, 2000s, um, 2008 or 9, so that wasn't that good, it was really bad. Um, but they did, um, a couple of home brewers did actually uh, polished up a bit and it did see a release to Atari age through, um, with official Coleco vision packaging and stuff like that. Um, but this is a more of a arcade version. Basically, this is an interesting approach. It's actually uh, something that Nathan and I developed. Um, it's a four color mixed um, play field. Usually your play field can only be one color on a line. We developed a way to simulate having four colors um, mixed. Um, and basically what it is, it's a, it's a 60 frame per second video player. So basically we took all the scenes from the arcade uh, he developed a method to render the scenes um, in Paint Shop using, not Paint Shop, Photoshop, one of those real um, complicated things that I don't know anything about, mm -hmm. um, using like uh, animated to Animator Plus, or I know I'm not saying all the right things. But anyway, so he developed all these things, and I developed a uh, um, converter that would take all this information and convert it into data that and compress it. And then I decompress it on the fly. And basically what we're showing is, you know, 60 frames of these scenes. It's actually kind of cool. To, it's, it's hard. It's impossible to explain, but you can come see it at the Champagne booth if you weren't, weren't interested. So it's a pretty good uh, version of Turbo um, that we hope to uh, also add, um, um, what do you call it, uh, driving support, controller support to right now. It only supports joystick. So fortunately, you can't add PAL support to these games. Um, because reading the paddle every line um, takes a bunch. You have to do it in the Atari, and it takes, I think, like 10 cycles, and you only have 76. So you take 10 cycles, you're going to take away something that you want, whether it's the changing of the color, resolution, a multicolored sprite, uh, or something. So um, so we're sticking with the joystick, but we'll probably we're going to try to add the driver control support. And then kicks is something that we... Um, uh, most people said it probably wouldn't work on the Atari. It actually does work pretty well, just mostly because of the lower resolution. It's only a 40. No matter what you do, your play field is still only 40 pixels wide. We do have 200 high, but um, to get multiple colors, it's actually a, a virtual 40 by 100 um, drawing area. But it still plays pretty much like Kicks. So if you're a Kicks fan, um, that's available to play for the first time um, on the Atari uh, out there as well. So. I do have separate screens for each one of these, but I kind of explained most of these. So there's the old Ladybug arcade on the left um, for the high score. If anyone's played Ladybug in the arcade, when you get a high score, you actually have to move your um, on Ladybug over the letters to spell your name. So we kind of added that, in, which is kind of cool. So that took some custom programming to get that to, to show all those uh, um, characters on the screen without any flicker. So that was a um, and also, the, we introduced uh, uh, another uh, insect called the spider that can actually open doors. So it's, uh, it's, it's, it's really exciting stuff. Um, there's Gore for Arcade. Again, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but it basically uh, it does have the voice. There's the CBS version on the left. Looks decent. Um, but there's uh, on the right, you can see there's uh, the Galaxy stage. It has the star field and some of that too. So it's kind of cool. Um, Plays pretty much like the arcade, so even has the badges. So as you destroy the uh, the flagship, we'll say you've been promoted to Space Colonel. The Gorf guy will say that too. So it's uh, we even introduced a couple of new um, um, ranks as well. Space Champion, that's a plan for champ games, and something else. Space Avenger. Um, so yeah. <laughs> There's Turbo Arcade again, just. Uh, this one's an interesting um, game. That, um, to fill all the scenes in there, we couldn't fit it into 32K, even compressed. We did come up with a better compression scheme, but it takes 
even with the arm, it takes too long to decompress because basically you have to decompress the entire screen on the fly, which is uh, even, like I said, no matter how much you put in there, you only have the arm for 10% of the time frame. So um, it's not the uh, godsend. Some people make it out to me. Yeah, there I go, I'm still defending myself. But <laughs> uh, anyway, so um, this one is actually using called CDFJ Plus that they've developed. Um, it's actually being used for a port of Xevious as well. Um, anyone who's played Xevious, um, it's devious, it's Xevious, you know, it's, it's their catchphrase. Mm -hmm. um, the guy needed extra K to put the big thing at the end, I guess it's a big burp or something like that. I don't know, but good news is that they work on all the kinks and I was able to take it. And uh, we're using it to uh, add um, multiple more scenes and stuff like that as well. So. That's cool. And again, there's the, there's the ColecoVision Turbo um, announcement as well. And there's Kicks. Uh, Kicks again. Again, it's available to play for the first time. Um, and uh, we are adding in some unique modes there. Two player co op mode where one guy fills it in and then it switches controls to the next guy. But also, we're going to have a two player um, co op mode where you're each controlling a point at the same time. But if you catch the other guy while he's drawing, you'll blow up and stuff like that. It promises to be very fun. Um, and then some quick works in progress. So that's basically 2022. And then after that, um, there's Lunar Lander. I think I uh, averted to that at some point. Um, Lunar Lander was actually the first thing I worked on for Kurt back in 2005. He had asked me to rewrite Lunar Lander because the one that they did for the flashback to flickered like a complete mess. Um, so since I didn't really know Atari program at the time, I basically just redid theirs. So it looked exactly the same, except it didn't flicker. It was color. It didn't use extra RAM. And it was only 8K versus 16K. And then I added in some new features. And he was pretty impressed, but unfortunately, never did get um, 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 included on anything. So I'm working with Alan. Where he's actually going to reach out to Atari to see if they'll actually let us release this one. So, um, I got one out trying to step on Amos Toes, but as you can see, we probably stepped in everyone's toes by now. <laughs> um, Champ Sports Baseball. This is our first unique game. I say unique, it's kind of based off of a championship baseball on the arcade game. But um, this one is actually kind of cool. It's uh, um, This goes back to my physics days back in Yukon. It actually uses actual physics. Um, um, equations for the flight of a baseball, something like that, that I was able to convert, even though you don't have a floating point in a, um, the Atari or, um, so it's using fixed point, there was the it was, took me a few months to work out, but it's kind of cool, there's wind and stuff like that, so it promises to be a pretty cool uh, baseball game. I've always dreamed of making sports games for the Atari, um, and um, I think baseball is going to be my first one, so. Um, you also have Ripoff Cinematronics, a game from the 1980s um, that I started in 2007 that I hope to finish at some point. Um, I plan on probably using the arm just because it's easier and introducing a four-player mode using the Quadtari where people can control the uh, enemies as well. Um, and that last picture, Elevator Action, almost looks impossible even for an Atari. And the reason why is because it almost is. This is actually using a, um, a new, uh, even something more powerful than bus um, than um, than the arm. Well, it's using the arm, um, but it's also using something called bus technology, um, which is a technology that was actually developed in the 80s. It was going to be used for the graduate computer um, by Atari um, that allowed you to update uh, TIA register. I don't remember I said, usually it takes like 21 cycles to update a player. Then Dave Crane figured out how to do it in seven frames. The bus, uh, the CDFJ stuff I've been talking about, we can do it in five. Um, the bus actually allows you to do it in three, which is, so basically what it's doing, it's actually capturing information while it's being written on the Atari bus and changing it on the bus, um, which is actually really kind of cool. That's what they were going to do. So this allows you to do, you know, instead of 14 updates per line, now you can do 21 updates per line. So you can see in this elevator action screenshot, I'm changing the background color um, one, two, three, like seven times over there, which would be impossible 
even with the bus, with the arm in CDFJ. Um, so this is actually a pretty cool working prototype. Daryl got me all excited and CDFJ boys saying his bus is the, it's the latest thing I started about five years ago. And um, unfortunately it's unstable on later model Ataris. So they decided that they wouldn't, well Al basically said he wouldn't release a game that day with bus because it wouldn't be compatible with later Ataris. But who knows, I may release it someday and have it just be a download. So um, am I over? A little bit, but you're okay. Okay. I'm almost done. I, I talk really fast. So. Okay. I'm almost done. Like okay. uh, two moments. Um, so there's this Luna Lander. Um, just a quick explanation about what it is. So basically, in 2005, they, the Chinese guys have made it for a uh, um, flashback too. It was terrible. Kurt said, please redo it. We did it. And they didn't release it. So it's kind of gone unreleased. So there's the arcade version on the left. And there's the. Uh, flashback to version on the right, um, which is just black and white. So anyway, this Champ Sports Baseball, this is gonna be part of the Champ Sports collection pack. Um, you can see um, this champ, Champions Baseball on the left, the arcade game, which is somewhat inspiring. I'm still not sure whether it's gonna be a simulation or an arcade game or a mix of both. Um, I love baseball, but I know a lot of people think it's boring. So I wanna make a game that people wanna play. So it might be more exciting if it's more like a 2020 baseball kind of game where it's, you know, um, more action and scoring and, you know, you get hundred points for a double or something like that. I don't know. Maybe I'll put in something of both. But I personally would like to see, you know, different teams and stats and things like that. But, you know, we're not all geeks. Well, maybe all of us are, but um, people, people paying the bills, you know. And there's a little, snippet of Champ Sports Hockey, which actually started back in 2003 as kind of uh, my test foray into 2600 programming. It didn't really get that far. It does scroll the screen and the um, puck does move around a little bit, but I kind of got frustrated and didn't really make much um, progress on it, but I hope to reboot that with Champ Sports Baseball. So, and um, I'm gonna introduce things, the whole, catch on champ sports is supposed to be like a tournament type situation where you have eight teams competing and then you know you either play in a computer or another player and then eventually you become a champion so we'll see we'll see if it catches on there's rip off the arcade game and just a render of the title screen um with the uh pseudo vector graphics so rip off is a game my brother and i paul played at uh, the woodstock fair the oldest fair in, the, in america in woodstock connecticut um for a few summers when it was there and um one of our favorites so sometime i'd like to finish today and then there's elevator action the elevator action was planned by atari and um, there's a prototype discovered this is one of the exciting prototypes i was talking about before um and then it was packaged even though it's they said it was like 95 percent completed it's really only about 70 percent completed it's not really finished but they did put it in a nice box and so it kind of looked like it was finished. I was disappointed because I love elevator action, but you really can't play it. Um, so I wanted to finish it myself. So that's what inspired me to start this other one. Um, I did start a CDFJ um, version. I wouldn't use the bus. You can see that on the right. You can see it's not as colorful. You know, you can't change the colors of the doors every, you know, every line. Um, you know, it's, it's obviously not going to look as good, but it should play as good. So you don't get any uh, additional uh, processing power with uh, the bus as far as gameplay. It's really for graphics, that's it. So um, so I may end up just biting the bullet and releasing a CDFA version or maybe one of each where elevator actually enhanced for those people that, because it's worked on all of my systems. Like I said, it works on probably 95% of the systems. But that's it. And one last thing I was talking about before is kind of bringing it back to uh, that music editor I did for the Atari 800, you know, with the Asian music and journey and stuff like that. Um, to help myself um, make a music and time effects for the Atari, I developed this program. This is actually an Atari program that runs on Atari um, that um, you can choose the uh, instrument, the volume, and, uh, um, and the uh, frequency, mix uh, the two TIA voices. You can see it even has like a piano roll display to show you what notes are in tune that you can actually play. And then uh, you can do repeats and um, um, ADSR envelope and stuff like that. So it's kind of cool. 
and it generates code for you and writes the, the save key. And then I developed a utility that can take that and generate actual code for you and, and clone it. So um, again, just something to help with, uh, with, with other things. So and then last slide. So, um, future plans. Um, want to kind of get away from ports. It's hard because that's what people want. People like ports. People want to be able to play the games that they know. And there's always a risk um, making a new game that people might not enjoy, might not even be fun, right? Um, so, uh, and also making, right now the good news about ports is that I don't have to worry about designing the game. I just have to worry about figuring out how to make it work on Atari. Um, if I start designing games, Mountain Raider, we're at 40 years plus. So um, you can see it takes a little bit longer to design a game. Even just baseball, I started that a year and a half ago and haven't really made any progress on it because there's not like a list in my head of what I want to do. Well, maybe it'll do this, maybe it'll do that. Well. Um, also, uh, considering maybe uh, venturing off into other Ataris, um, people are always ask me, can you make a 5200 game? I love the 5200, by the way, so um, I wouldn't be against that. I especially would bring me back to my original roots, which was developing for the Atari 100. Um, you can make games for both um, and have them work on both. So that, that might be a good way to get me back into uh, making something that's not just hacks of ASCII characters, but an actual assembly game for the Atari. Um, and then even the 700. Again, I talked to someone about the 700, it's terrible. Um, I think, it's, I shouldn't say it's terrible, but it's uh, like something I have no attachment to. And when I did finally play it, it was like, you know, just underwhelming. So I probably, there's plenty of great 700 programmers out there that are doing wonderful things with it. So um, that's it. Now we just have an hour of questions. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> That's it. I have another one tomorrow. Four thirty is going to be more technical. Apologies, this went right over. And probably um, a lot of nostalgia at the beginning kind of got, got me off uh, track here. But hopefully, you guys enjoyed the, the talk, and I appreciate you showing up. And uh, um, if you have anything or any questions, or actually want to see some of these games, do have a booth set up out there. Thanks everyone for helping set up, especially you, Whitney, and uh, back, back there. Um, um, and see, see see these games in action. So that's it. So appreciate it. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.